So, welcome to machine learning. Um, and let's see, there's five. We're missing uh, just Owen, who has to take German at the same time, so he'll never be here. Uh, but he's going to be online. So, hi, Owen. Yeah. Um, all right, so this looks like everybody that's supposed to be here. Excellent. Um, and so let's go through the business real quick and then uh, get to it. The syllabus is the usual stuff. You guys aren't idiots. You know how college works. Read the syllabus. Um, we'll talk about ChatGPT for a little bit. So it'd be kind of ironic if I forbade you from using AI in a course that's on AI, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be really kind of ironic. Um, I think you will find very quickly it <laughs> that ChatGPT would cannot help us with something like this, right? It can't generate code, AI code yet. So, um, anyway, so yeah, we'll we'll talk about a lot of that stuff. So let's just pull up the syllabus real quick and kind of talk through some some broad strokes and then get to it. Um, all right, so. Uh, I've had most of you in class before, but not always. So you guys know me. I'm around a lot. Come by the office. I haven't gotten my scheduling tool up and running just yet, but I will once I get my calendar uh, working. All right, here's the book. Um, it's available for free through the library in ebook form um, uh, in like extremely unrestricted license. So you guys can basically, you know, don't have to do anything. Uh, other selections, articles, things like that, I'll put on Canvas as relevant. And then uh, it doesn't matter what computer you have, but basically what you need to do is to have the following. Uh, a remote desktop client, um, Microsoft is one of them. It's a perfectly fine one. Um, it'll run on Mac also. It doesn't really matter which one you use, um, but that one's a good one. Um, and then you also need an SSH client and an SFTP client. Those of you who are on a Mac, um, SSH is built in, so you don't have to install that. SFTP you can do through the terminal built in, but if you want a graphical interface, you need to download another program. So um, for those of you who with Windows machines, uh, you'll need to download, find a program to do SSH, a terminal emulator, and... SFTP for file transfer, in addition to the remote desktop thing. Those are really the only three pieces of software you have to install. You can go ahead and install, you know, have Python and VS Code and stuff like that on your own machines, but for, for very simple things, that's probably going to be sufficient. For anything big, like when we're running image recognition models and things like that, your laptops are just the, running these on your laptops will destroy them, right? They'll just melt. They, they they're not designed for that kind of high power. What we do have, however, is a really high power machine de designed specifically for machine learning tasks. And guess what's in it? 16 core Threadripper Pro, 128 gigs of RAM, and two RTX 4090s. Okay. So, yes, so that workstation, uh, Dr. Brown and I uh, put a grant proposal together, and we were able to get that uh, at the very, very beginning of the summer. And then I spent all summer futzing with it to get it set up and figure out how it works and all of that. Um, and it's currently offline. Now that Bear has cleaned up his mess in the second floor computer lab, physics lab, then I can actually put it where it belongs and get it connected. And I'll post the IP address to... Canvas, uh, and we'll talk about how to do remote login and that sort of stuff later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, SSH or the remote desktop, right? So SSH is text only, just console, and remote desktop would be if you want GUI. Um, so, yeah, uh, so it'll always be on. It'll always be uh, running Linux, and you are hereby forbidden from ever rebooting it because that will kick everybody off and... Right, so, uh, but we'll talk about that later. So just get, get those programs installed um, so you've got what you need, and uh, we'll, we'll go through the details later. So, um, so the overview of the course, um, the term machine learning uh, was first coined 
by Arthur Samuel in 1959. And uh, Arthur, uh, he worked at IBM at the time and then later became a, a professor. Um, but one of the things he did uh, with at IBM was research, essentially, and uh, on what we might call machine learning. And his, he's got a very famous paper on checkers using uh, machine learning to, to kind of work through a checkers program. Um, and we'll actually look at um, maybe a little bit of that paper. Um, checkers is kind of a complex game in some sense, but games actually provide a really interesting way to get started with a lot of machine learning um, because, well, and games are fun, right? In fact, we'll play a game today. Um, and uh, anyway, so obviously the, the world of machine learning has grown dramatically since then. Uh, Self-driving cars exist to various extents. Of course, we all know about ChatGPT and other generative AI models. Um, and we're going to look at basically the theory and the practice of all of this and the math that makes it work and the programming of it. Um, since this is a cross-listed math and CS class, uh, and a half of you are taking it as math, and half of you are taking it as computer science. I'm going to try and thread the needle on making it not too mathy and not too programming, but it's going to be hard, right, to, to, to get that balance exactly right. So um, just bear with me, right? Um, because I know those of you who are taking it as CS have... Um, some of you have a lot of programming background, and those of you who are taking it math. I mean, some of you guys ha have only done 111, right? Has anybody done just CS 111? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, not a end of the world, right? We don't really need significantly more than 111, and we'll work through stuff. Um, this is a small class. There's 10 of you guys. I'm perfectly content for this, this, you know, a lot of this stuff to happen in small groups or pairs or whatever. Um, I want this to be kind of a project-based, I mean, this is an upper-level class, right? I'm not an expert in machine learning by any stretch of the imagination. I spent six weeks this summer kind of fiddling with it, and I think I kind of get some stuff now, and we'll have fun. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is going to be much more of a research seminar style, not so much, you know, me yakking at you every day. Um, I wanted to be as project-based as possible, as open-ended as possible, and stuff like that. Um, we won't have exams, because why? Why would we need them? So, because most of what we'll be doing is sort of small and medium-sized projects. So, anyway. Um, okay, so what, what are we going to be doing? Um, I'm going to go through sort of a... a uh, an overview of the sort of history of machine learning to kind of wet our palate. But basically what I kind of want to get through in this course is uh, talking about several different kinds of machine learning. The first is some decision tree based stuff. And that's kind of what Samuel was working on. And then also where we'll probably spend the majority of the semester is things that involve artificial neural networks. Um, and there are several different types of those. Um, and the mathematical foundations that make all of this stuff work. And then it would be remiss for us to not talk about some of the ethical um, concerns uh, that AI and, and machine learning raises. Uh, and there's a whole host of ethical issues. Um, most of you have had a course with me before. You're going to have assignments. You're going to turn them in. Maybe they need to be revised. I'll kick them back to you for revision as needed. Just don't suck and keep on top of things and everything will be cool. Okay. I didn't write a huge long paragraph here about late policies and all of that crap because this is a 300 level class and I expect you guys are, are beyond that by now. Uh, okay. Don't miss class, but if you have to, this is why I'm going to live stream at least the stuff that's more lecture oriented. I don't want every day to be lecture oriented because again, that's boring, but there's some amount of it that just has to happen. Um, just don't miss class, okay? Um, and if you do, then this is why I do the recordings um, so that you can go back and use them. Um, you know, be use your head when working with other people and 
uh, use your head when using generative AI systems. Okay, and then the rest of this stuff is boilerplate, you know, stuff from the registrar and all the other different offices on campus. So if you've got any questions, then talk to me later. But this is not any of y'all's first rodeo. Um, our final exam time, we'll do presentations and stuff because y'all will do, pro you know, we'll have projects by that point of the course. That's when our final would be, so that's when we'll do the, the presentations, as is tradition. Um, okay, so any syllabus questions? Pretty straightforward. No? Okay. Obviously, there'll be a bunch more stuff on here as we get going, but I wanted to, for now, go into uh, this and just talk a little bit of... Oops, wrong button little bit of some of the history of machine learning just to kind of motivate where we're going to go with stuff. Um, this is hopelessly incomplete, hopelessly non-detailed. Uh, I'm skipping, I'm sure, a lot of things, but it just to kind of, like I said, get us going, it's, it's probably sufficient. Um, okay, so maybe the first instance of something like this is this thing called the Mechanical Turk. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Yeah, it was built in uh, Europe. I forget the name, the, the guy's name who built it. But essentially what it was, it purported to be a machine that could play chess against a human. Right? That's pretty cool. And, and by the way, we're talking late 18th century here, right? So Ben Franklin played this thing. Um, Charles Babbage eventually played against this thing. Um, so, yeah, is this, this guy invented a machine that could play chess against a human and could sometimes win, too. That's pretty cool. Well, what's the, what's the spoiler alert? Yeah, it was actually a hoax. There was a guy inside, right? So it wasn't actually a machine, but he fooled everybody, right? And when did it? When did they find out that it was a hoax? And it was well. I mean, the guy had already died that had built this thing, right? And it had been touring around, and all kinds of famous people had played against it, including Napoleon, right? So, like, this is a pretty serious deal, right? Everybody and their mother had played against this thing, um, and it wasn't until there just so happened to be a fire at a place where it was being stored at some museum when, you know, it was damaged and then sort of revealed that, oh, there's this, like, obvious spot inside where a person, like, I, I don't know how, honestly, it made it that far before people figured out it's a hoax. I mean, like, I mean, how did the guy not sneeze uh, once the entire time he was playing against people, right? And then all of a sudden there's a sneeze coming from inside the box. Oh, well, gee, I wonder what's going on there. So, anyway, it was a hoax, but um, Babbage... Uh, was, like I said, one of the people who played a couple of matches against this thing. And he was starting to think, you know, this is probably a hoax. But Babbage was also building machines, right, to do calculations and stuff. And so he started to think, you know, would it be possible to actually build a machine to do it? Like, or in what eventually became the case. So what's Babbage famous for? You guys remember? Come on. Oh, there we go. So Babbage built, well, didn't ever build the whole thing. He started designing this machine called the differential engine. And it was essentially a mechanical calculator uh, for using a particular mathematical method called the method of finite differences to um, uh, basically compute values that you would use like in a table of numbers. So in the 19th century, early 19th century, how did you navigate around the world, right? I mean, he's, he's British, right? So let's, we have to kind of think about what were the British doing in the 19th century? Yeah, lots of empire stuff going on, right? And in particular, Britain being an island, how did it, you know, militarily maintain its empire? 
a really good navy, right? And that meant, of course, sailing around the world. Well, how do you sail around the world in the 19th century? Because you don't just pop out your GPS or your iPhone. Uh, yeah, you'd use a sextant, amongst other things, right? But you would navigate by the stars, right? And so spherical trigonometry and celestial navigation, right, is a subject that basically nobody teaches anymore, except me and a few people, um, and the Naval Academy for obvious reasons. Um, so, uh, but back then, right, you also didn't have calculators, or at least not machines that are calculators. So that table of numbers that you would use uh, that had like the, all the trig values and stuff that you would need to do celestial calculations would be in a book in the form of tables. Well, somebody had to compute that stuff and also print it. Well, what do you think happens? Sorry, that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, if somebody computes it and that somebody is a person, then what's going to happen? There are going to be errors, right? And even if they compute everything correctly, just to print it is probably going to have some typographical errors. It's just inevitable, right? So Babbage, one of the things he wanted to do was design a machine that could compute those things error-free and also print them. So this is a picture of one of the two uh, now replicas of this machine, Okay, this is the one at the uh, London Science Museum um, in London, obviously. Uh, there were two of them built. Uh, they were both built at the same time, yeah. Mountain View, yes. 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 So the one in the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, so they're identical. In fact, they were produced together. The London Science Museum which has some of Babbage's and papers and stuff, found some rich internet dude and basically, you know, got him to donate all the money to do a replica of the machine from Babbage's drawings and some of the parts that Babbage had built, but he never built the whole thing. So he donated the money on the condition that they build two instead of one, because if you're rich, well... Um, the, actually, how many of you guys have seen the movie Contact? It's from the 90s, so no... There's a great line in it, and it's like, first rule of government spending, why buy one when you could have two at twice the price, <laughs> right? So anyway, so he donates enough money to build two of these things, one of which was on loan to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, and eventually, and it maybe is still there or maybe not, it, um, it, it, it's destined to be in his living room. Right, as one does as a rich internet person. You just have, you know, oh, and here's my... Cezanne and my Monet and my Babbage differential engine and, you know. Um, yeah. And in fact, this is the thing I like about the museum in Mountain View as opposed to the London Science Museum. London Science Museum is in a glass case. Not only can you touch it, but every afternoon they actually use it, right? So every afternoon at like 2 o'clock or whatever, one of the docents, you know, everybody gathers around, they explain kind of how it works, and then they, they turn the crank and have it go through one computation. And it probably was not only the, what we call the, the first or maybe, a, maybe the second, I'll call the anti kithera mechanism the first, computer, but it also had the first uh, accessory because it had the printer attachment, right? And it prints it, bam, right there on the paper. So not only is it computing it error-free, but it's printing it error-free, and that's a good thing in, well, if, it, if Babbage had finished it, he never did, yeah. Yeah. Hand crank. Yeah, so you can see it kind of here, this thing, right? You would turn it. Uh, the one at Mountain View, they, it's a little longer so that the, you know, the radius is bigger and you get more uh, force out of it because... You do. Oh, <laughs> I've missed your puns. Yes. Um, and the idea, of course, and is that it could very easily have then been powered by water or steam, uh, you know, something like that. Um, but at least for the demonstration's sake, just a hand crank is sufficient. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Babbage built parts of this thing. 
and had drawings and stuff of it, but never built the full thing. And part of the reason is because as he was building it and designing it, um, and Parliament was giving him money, by the way, to do it, right? Because they saw the utility of this for, uh, you know, tables of numbers, for empire uh, administration, all of these things, right? They saw that this would be a useful gadget. But when he was designing it, he started to think, you know, actually I can do better. I can make something that's not just a calculator, but can actually make decisions, right? And he called this thing the analytical engine. He also never built that, and there is no replica of it because he never... Yeah, it's so complicated. But essentially, it would have been a mechanical computer, okay? And what makes a computer different from a calculator is the ability to do if-then type statements, decisions, right? If equal or not equal or something, do this, otherwise do that. And so thinking about the, the machine, the, the, the analytical engine, even though he couldn't build it or didn't have it built, he could still think sort of theoretically, how would it work or what it would it mean to compute or to have this thing be able to do thoughts. And chess was certainly one of the things he thought about, probably inspired a little bit by his encounter with the Mechanical Turk as to what would it mean to have a machine capable of playing chess? How would that machine operate? And if it's the same machine that you could do other tasks on, like a general purpose machine, well then how would you, like what instructions would it use? Right? So, um, yeah, so kind of early, early stuff here. Now, if we flash forward, I mean, to some extent we could argue Babbage was about 100 years ahead of his time. Um, you know, early, mid 19th century, mid 20th century, what was going on? Well, before that, but yeah, wars. Yeah, lots of wars. Yeah. Okay. So we have Turing, right? Turing uh, in England, amongst other things, you know, and, you know, coming up with a theory of what he called a Turing machine but then also building a bunch of stuff that was instrumental, and he's not the only one, obviously, uh, but instrumental in the Allies' uh, ability to crack German Enigma transmissions, right? And um, so he built machines to do stuff. Um, but another guy that probably none of you have heard of is this one. How many of you have heard of Conrad Zusa before? Yeah? You've heard of him? Mm. Okay, yes. Yeah, if you ever get to Mountain View in California, yeah, you've got to go to this museum. It really is epic. Um, it, and it's really well done. Um, Mountain View. Uh, it's like, yeah, Bay Area. Like, a friend of mine, well, he was one of my roommates in college. Um, his parents live in Mountain View. So I went out one summer and visited him for like a week or so. And... We just, you know, you walk a lot of places, and it's Northern California, so the weather's gorgeous, right? So we're walking. It's like, yeah, this is where Yahoo started, and oh, over there is where this started, and this here's where this company was that none of you have heard of ever, right? Like in, uh, 90s dot com companies that either got bought out or fizzled out of existence, um, including a bunch of search engines that once Google came on the market, just they all evaporated overnight, essentially because Google outdid them, right? Um, so, but anyway, the museum is there. It's not far from Google's headquarters campus. It is a really, really good, good place to see. Um, anyway, so Zusa uh, was German, and he's a little less known, but um, he designed and built what we might call now general purpose computers um, out of using telephone relays as switching elements, uh, as opposed to later machines would use vacuum tubes and then eventually transistors. Um, and they worked, and they were, you know, programmable to some extent. But they were shrouded in secrecy because he was doing this essentially with funding from the Nazis um, in much in the same way that Werner von Braun was doing rocketry 
at the behest of the Nazi, you know, the military regime. Yeah. Being the first guy to build a fully functional, general programmable computer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so in some sense, he's kind of an unsung hero and faded into obscurity because, uh, you know, and it's interesting, right, that, that somebody like Von Braun was, uh, you know, captured by you know, the American military along with a bunch of other people and moved to the U.S. and eventually became sort of the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket that's got, got us to the moon, right? Von, von Braun in the 70s was a household name. Zusa? Basically, nobody outside of academia had any idea who this guy was. In fact, I didn't even know he existed until probably five or six years ago. I'd just never heard of him, right? And I'm in the business of knowing this kind of stuff, right? So um, that just goes to show how kind of little is known or little is taught about him um, and his work. Um, I haven't read any of his stuff. Of course, I don't know any German. It's too bad Owen's not here because he could really help with that. But yeah, so he built built machines, um, some of which were destroyed in the war and then rebuilt later. Um, and, uh, you know, had he, for example, come to the United States and been with the early computer pioneers here, Eckert and Moakley and, you know, some of these other people, who knows what might have happened. But um, yeah, but um, amongst other things, he started designing what you might call a programming language. Uh, he called it Plankalkul. And uh, amongst other things, started to think about, well, what would it mean to write a chess program within this thing um, to be able to have a machine play chess? Okay, great. Um, now, much simpler game, um, but in the early 50s, um, at a, uh, an expo in Canada, a company um, had this new type of vacuum tube that they were trying to advertise as being really cool. And so they built this sort of special purpose little computer around it called Birdie the Brain. And Birdie would play tic-tac-toe against a human opponent and, you know, could do pretty well. I mean, tic-tac-toe is certainly not chess, right, in terms of complexity, um, it's also, to some extent, what happens if both players play a perfect game of tic-tac-toe? You always get a draw, right? So somebody has to screw up to some extent to have a victory. Um, and so, okay, maybe tic-tac-toe is not the most in, uh, interesting game in that sense, but it's certainly very simple, and that's a great place to start, right, in terms of, of uh, machine learning. Um, so... Right, so this machine was on this expo. Uh, this picture, it was in Life magazine. It made a huge splash, and the company that, that actually developed it, like their product went nowhere because the transistor came out not much later. Um, but Birdie the Brain was certainly a, a big, big splash at the time. Um, all right, I mentioned Arthur Samuel. Here's the first bit of his paper from 59. Um, it was in the IBM Journal, which is an internal journal for IBM research. Um, there's a second version of, or second part that came out uh, quite a bit later. Um, and uh, he was programming for a particular IBM mainframe machine at the time. And uh, the program, well, okay, so there's, this is the downside. I got in contact with the archives, the IBM archives, and no copy of his program, the punch cards, or any of that stuff, it, it's gone, as far as we know, which really, really sucks. Um, so his paper has some descriptions about the characteristics of the program, but no actual code, which is really unfortunate, because that would have been really interesting to see exactly how he did it. Um, he was probably, he, he was either programming an assembly or, you know, machine code or maybe, maybe uh, Fortran, but um, I doubt it was in Fortran. 
59. No, C didn't exist yet. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, 70s. Right? The predecessors to C were in the 60s. Um, so uh, anyway, so he talks about, you know, 8 to 10 hours of machine playing time. That would probably be about 8 seconds on a modern computer. Uh, in terms of uh, how fast computers are compared to what he would have been using. Um, so, okay, checkers. Now, checkers is interesting because it's certainly a lot more complex than tic-tac-toe, but it's not nearly as complex as chess, right? Um, and so, okay, that's a perfectly interesting way to go. Um, so he worked on that. Now, in the 40s and 50s, there were a couple of people. So McCullough and Pitts were working together, and uh, Rosenblatt was another guy. And essentially what they were thinking about is, well, how could we model neural networks in the brain and model them in a way that maybe, you know, isn't by itself perfectly a neural network in the brain. We're not necessarily going to be build, build an artificial brain. But how can we maybe understand this for simple, for simple structures and simple mechanisms? And so they came up with this idea of where you think of a neuron as taking inputs and having some sort of output, and it has weights, and it basically just does a linear combination of the inputs, and then possibly pipes this thing through some function to get a single output, right? So this thing they called the perceptron, um, is sort of an artificial neuron, a single one of them. And then a network would be a bunch of these things all tacked together. Okay? Um, they also then started to figure out sort of the simple, like how would you make something learn, quote unquote, using one of these. And we'll obviously get into all those details as to how it works. Um, but as you can imagine, basically this turns into a crap ton of linear algebra matrix multiplication, which is fast in some sense, but you need a lot of memory and a fast computer to do it really, really quickly. So the neural network stuff kind of faded away and it really has hit a resurgence because modern computers have things in them that are really good at doing matrix computations really fast, namely video cards. Right, GPUs, um, all the graphics computations, are, it's essentially all just a bunch of big pile of linear algebra. And they're very good at dividing the problem into lots of little tiny parts and doing that very quickly. So this is why the hardware you need to do much modern machine learning research is exactly the same hardware, or essentially, as what you need to play Cyberpunk at 4K and with ray tracing and all of the cool stuff, right? Basically the same hardware. Um, so because that hardware was not, you know, computers were not sophisticated enough, anything beyond really rudimentary neural net, nets was just not feasible for a while, even though they'd sort of come up with some of the theory of it. Um, and so that, that kind of took a back seat for a while. Now where this really became famous, so in the nineties, uh, IBM had a machine Deep blue, and what did it do? And it made waves. Yeah. It played chess and beat Gary Kasparov, who was at that time the world champion, you know, the, the top rated chess player, right? And not just a one off, right? Like it it really, really nailed him. Right. Um so then later there's another game that's infinitely more complex than chess called Go. And uh, OpenAI, uh, or not OpenAI, it's, uh, yeah, it's Google DeepMind, but it wasn't Google at that point. They bought it. Um, became, uh, started to develop uh, an AI system to play Go. Okay, this game. Go is far more complex than chess. Um, there are, I think it's what, 19 by 19? It's a grid. Each 
spot can have, so the, the, the uh, stones go on the intersections. Um, and so it's a 19 by 19 grid. There are three states, therefore, that any intersection could be in, white stone, black stone, or empty. Um, the rules of the game is you're trying to capture area, um, and there's certain rules about where you can play and how you capture area. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about all that later just for, for uh, uh, completeness. Um, but if you just think of the number of total positions or states that the board could be in, it's 3 to the 19 times 19, right? There are 19 by 19 spaces. There are three states that any state could be in. Not all of those are valid configurations because of the rules of the game, but if we just take sort of the number of legal board positions in a game of Go, there are more of them than there are subatomic particles in the observable universe. That's all, right? Okay, so what does that mean? If we wanted to program a computer to play Go, can we enumerate every possible game? No, it's impossible. Like, we can't even get anywhere close to enumerating every possible game. There are just too many possibilities. Okay, so the, the checkers game or Birdie the Brain, was using what we'll call a decision tree, right? And, and we'll talk about some of the details here in a second. Uh, but for something like Go, or I would say even chess, a full decision tree is just not feasible. There's just too many possibilities, okay? Um, and AlphaGo made waves because uh, the, the opponent that it's playing... Um, and I'm just suddenly, uh, Lee, uh, Lee Sujol, Sujol, I'm blanking, um, Seedol, but whatever. Um, it beat him. So they played five games, one per day, and I think it won four out of the five matches uh, against him. And this was like a huge deal in Korea. So he, he's South Korean. They played the games in, in South Korea um, because Go is like, you know, in Asia, taught the same way that chess or checkers might be here in the U.S., right? It's a big deal. Um, and so, you know, there's like press coverage and TV. It's on TV, right, in South Korea, him playing these matches with commentators and stuff like you'd expect on ESPN, right? Like, oh, I didn't expect the computer. To, what is the computer doing? Why did it go there? And um, yeah, so... Uh, there's a fantastic documentary about this on free on YouTube. I'll post a link to it. Um, and I think you guys will learn a lot by watching that. Um, and also, for that matter, um, <laughs> so um, as kind of a maybe a good way to get started, uh, how many of you guys ever watched Last Week Tonight with John Oliver? Yeah. So he's got a, a good one, a good segment on AI, actually, that it doesn't get into a lot of the detail, like technical details. But it does get into some of the ethical kind of questions. So I'll post links to these things. I think you guys will enjoy watching them and learn learn some things. And also it'll um, maybe make you think about um, some of the ethical things, right? Ethical and uh, societal concerns that, that we need to be cognizant of as we uh, go through this class. So like I said, one of the things that made um, the this field really open up is the availability of fast and highly scalable processing uh, in the form of GPUs. Um, I just picked a picture from one of NVIDIA's uh, uh, presentations, but uh, where, you know, it can do the kinds of computations necessary in machine learning ridiculously fast. And... Um, yeah, so this is why we can have things like ChatGPT, right? So ChatGPT is a generative pre-trained um, thing. And what that means is essentially you feed it text. It decomposes this text into what it calls tokens. Tokens are a few letters at a time. And then because it's been trained on just gargantuan quantities of data, 
books, uh, websites, these sorts of things, it sort of recognizes patterns um, and you give it something and it can generate data based on that. So for example, here, tell me how ChatGPT works and then blah, 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 there it goes, right? And I mean, you guys have all played with ChatGPT at this point, right? I would hope so, just to see what it could do. Yeah, Farden. Yeah, so the, the difference between pre-training and dynamically trained. Well, something like Bing would have had to have been pre-trained um, because, well, okay, if you, as something, right, because otherwise it would be just gibberish at first, right? It's got to be trained on something. Um, to what extent ChatGPT is dynamically retraining itself as it gets interaction with users? I'm not sure. Okay, um, and with with um, Bard or some of the other ones, again, to what extent they're using? Yeah. So, but how they're doing it and how they're ensuring that that data isn't garbage? I don't know. If you look up what again, sorry. Yes, anything after it was trained, right? Because it doesn't know what happened. And it wasn't, it's not internet connected in the sense that it can't go out and do Google searches, right? So, um, yeah, so in that case, it may be that it, the model has been pre-trained, but it also has the ability to use something like Bing, which to, to access current information. That's different than it being retrained. Possibly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and this is the frontier, right, of large language models is this stuff, right? Okay, fair. But there's also four. Yeah. Feed it back in. Well... And ChatGPT4, if memory serves, uh, Wolfram, the company that makes Mathematica, they've been collaborating to basically integrate so that ChatGPT and Mathematica's engine can, can communicate to each other. So that, like, because I don't know if you've tried it with GPT 3.5. So last fall, right, in November or December or whatever it was, when we did the derivative B, uh, as an experiment... I had ChatGPT open on my computer and was giving it the questions from the derivatives B as we were going. It was awful. Like, it couldn't do freshman calculus. Now, I bet you GPT-4, especially if it's got Mathematica plugged into it effectively, would mop the floor with anybody in calculus. Um, so, but to what extent it's the same model is pulling in external information versus that external information changing the model itself, I don't know, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and I, I just don't know. I mean, partly because I haven't really done anything more than play with ChatGPT because, uh, I mean, like, it's, it's not, not useful. Bad. It's not useful in my line of work, right? Yeah. 
I mean, you can ask it to write Python code too, right? It doesn't need Mathematica to do it because it was trained on things that, amongst other things, include books on Python, right? In the same way that it was trained on, um, you know, Stephen King novels or whatever, um, which this is starting to get into some of the ethical considerations because uh, do you think they paid Stephen King anything to use his pipe his novels into the model? No, they did not. Should it be? Right. Right. Well, partly because it's less general, right? It's being trained for a more specific domain of knowledge, whereas ChatGPT is a very generic domain of knowledge. And ChatGPT can do pretty well at some stuff. Like, I mean, right here, right? What it spit out there is a perfectly good couple, you know, paragraph about what ChatGPT is. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, like, uh, I don't know, ask it about some EQ paper topic and it will probably spit out something that's relatively intelligent, right? It won't be very deep. It'll be kind of surface level. Um, and this is why, of course, everybody in the humanities is freaking out about ChatGPT because what do they basically think? This is the end of the college essay? Well, maybe that's not a bad thing, to be perfectly honest, because if you're giving college students a writing prompt that ChatGPT can write a B-plus answer, you know what? You deserve to get those writing. You, you deserve those papers. Write better prompts. Um, is the, the kind of way I think about it. But um, yeah, so everybody in, in Center Hall is, you know, the war went in November and j through January last year, the world is just over as far as they're concerned. Um, so anyway, which, which kind of gets us to, you know, something like this, right? AI, machine learning and AI are essentially the same thing, right? What are the fears that people have, both founded and unfounded? Well, the two pictures on the left you guys probably recognize the bottom left one. What's that from? Yeah, the Terminator series, right? So Skynet was this AI that was developed to basically help with the military. Um, and they connected all the military systems to it. And this was in Terminator 3, I think, is when they, they ex showed exactly how this happened. But they connected it to... Uh, all the nuclear weapons platforms, and what did the AI basically realize? That what was the threat to the AI's existence? Humans. So let's just kill all the humans, right? And so then it launched nuclear weapons. We got global thermonuclear war, and, and yeah, you know how the story goes. Um, what about the top left one? You guys recognize that one? It's another movie. Nope. Kind of like it, yeah, but it's also from the 80s. It's called War Games. Yeah, so this kid basically finds this computer, like, mainframe, and it's essentially a military's thing for doing simula war simulations. But the problem is, and, and I don't want to spoil it, right, the, totally, um it thought that it was actually real instead of not real. So it thought that there was actually a bunch of global, like the Russians had launched a bunch of missiles and everybody's freaking out because is it going to launch missiles in return? And, uh, you know, so anyway, go, just go watch the movie. Um, but <clears throat> the computer eventually learns that... <clears throat> Global thermonuclear war, right? So he logs into this system and there's a bunch of games. You can play chess, you can play checkers, you can play, you know, one of those things. And one of the options is global thermonuclear war. You know, because nothing 
says sitting down with a nice cup of coffee and a friend to play a nice round of global thermonuclear war, right? But what does the machine eventually learn about global thermonuclear war as a game? It's a very strange game. Why is it a strange game? What's weird about global thermonuclear war compared to, say, chess? Well, okay, yeah, people die, but like, let's let's think, take of global thermonuclear war as um, as a hypothetical thing, as opposed, to, huh? Right. It's weird because in chess. Somebody wins, right? And there are winning moves and there are bad moves. But in global thermonuclear war, all moves are bad, except to not play the game, right? So the computer realizes this is a very strange game. The only winning move is to not play, right? Yeah, you don't play global thermonuclear war because once you start playing, you lose. So if you don't play, you haven't lost, which is better than losing. That's weird, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, so far mentioned MAD or mutually assured destruction, right, is the sort of cornerstone of Cold War nuclear politics, geopolitics. The Russians have nukes, the Chinese have nukes, we have nukes. Other than when only the United States had nukes, and we only had two of them, and we used two of them, right, at the end of World War II. Yeah, and, and of course, yeah, the, the, the movie, it's sort of fitting that, that we're talking about this, right? Why did we never use nukes against the Soviets, and why did they never use them against us, particularly after the 60s? We both had them, and not only that, but they're fitted against, or fitted on rockets, right? So, you know, like a... a when the United States bombed Hiroshima, they could have shot that plane down, right? In which case, no nuke. Didn't happen. Uh, but in the 50s, the only, nuclear, the only delivery mechanism for a nuclear weapon was an airplane, which are, of course, uh, prone to being shot down. Well, so what happened in the 50s on? Well, the space race... Well, and guess what? Putting a man into orbit and putting a missile and dropping it on Moscow are essentially the same problem, right? The only difference is what you put at the top of the rocket and which way you point it. It's the same rocket otherwise, basically, right? Well, very fancy V2 rockets, right? Um, so... Point being that two sides having possession of nuclear weapons means if we use them against somebody else, they're going to use them in retaliation against us. And by the time they're all on intercontinental ballistic missiles, they can't be shot down, essentially. I mean, right? And we have thousands of them, right? So if we launch a thousand weapons at Russia and they launch a thousand weapons back at us and suddenly 2,000 thermonuclear warheads are going off, right? You guys have all played Fallout or seen Terminator. You know how this is going to end. Not well for humans. Um, huh? Well, yeah, well, and where... Um, so anyway... The, the, a, the, the ethical or, or sort of fears of this, right, is that uh, right now, AIs can do, do, they can do harm, right? We're not to the point of nuclear annihilation, but, you know, what would happen if we started deploying, I mean, we already do deploy drones in battlefield situations, the difference is the drones are controlled by humans, right? But what would happen if we had an autonomous military thing with weapons on board? How does it decide who's enemy and who's not? And who programs that? Well, this is starting to get kind of sticky, right? So, um, 
Yeah, so I want to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, as we go through this semester, we're thinking about a lot of these ethical considerations. And you guys probably didn't think that the first day of machine learning we'd be talking about global thermonuclear war, but... Huh? Yeah, why does it have teeth and red eye? I, it just, because it's a... Because it's a movie. Yeah, it's got to look scary for the sake of a movie. I mean, come on, give them some artistic license here, right? Um, okay, so, um, yeah. So let's actually go back to, um, for the moment, let's start with the game of tic-tac-toe. Um, or in some countries, it's called knots and crosses. Um, yeah. So how does the game work? I mean, have you guys all played this game at some point in your life, I would hope? Yeah, okay. So how does this game work? Yeah, so who, somebody gets to go first. Let's say, uh, all right, Bear, you're going to play against me. I'm X, and I'm going to go there. Well, maybe, because we could get it to a draw. Where do you want to go? And then I'll go here. Yeah, bear has to go here. And then let's say that I'll go here. And then that means bear has to go here. And then I'll go here and bear goes there. And then because of that, I have to go here, right? It's the only spot left. Okay, so in this case, if the two players play a perfect game, right? then uh, every game will result in a draw um, for this particular game. Um, all right, now, if we go back, how could we maybe think about getting a program or, or analyzing this game in sort of a more algorithmic and less human way? So let's go back to the very first move that I made. Okay. All right, so I made this move. Now... Let's assume that we have a program, or bear is the program, okay, a machine, and it wants to win. That's the goal of the game, after all. So in this instance, bear has eight options as to where to move, right, the eight remaining squares. And what we could think is, all right, let's suppose that bear moves in the top left square. And then let's also suppose that in a different instance, bear moves in the, here, let me draw this a little bigger. Bear moves here. And then in another instance, bear could move at the top right. It is, I'm overdoing it, okay. Um, because, as you can probably guess, there's, is there any real difference between the top left and the top right in terms of this board? No, because one of them is just a rotation of the other, okay? Um, so, so, yes, you could reduce the complexity by using your head a little bit, okay? But let's just, for the sake of right this instant, not worry about trying to simplify it at all, right? So I've drawn three of the potential eight moves that Bear could make, right? And there are obviously more of them. I won't draw them. But Bear is playing me, and I want to win. So what I could do is say, okay, I'm going to move here, and then if, I'm, if Bear is the program that's running this, Bear could say, okay, I could move here, I could move here, I could move there right? But then let's assume that we do go here. Then how many moves do I, the opponent, have? In this case, seven remaining, okay? Um, and for each of those, Bear has a corresponding counter move of how there are six total things, right? But so doing that is going through a decision tree, Right, so this decision could yield, let's say, I'll just draw two of them for sake of demonstration. It could be that he moved there and then I decide to move here. Okay, or it could be 
he moved there and I decide to move here. And I'm just picking something as an example. Okay, so for each of those two potential moves, could we think about where his counter move is? And for each of those counter moves, can we think of all the potential counter counter moves and basically go all the way down the tree until such time as either there's a draw or a win for one of the two players? Yeah? Okay. So if we can enumerate all of this stuff, or rather get the computer to do it for us, right, because this obviously gets pretty big pretty quickly, then that is decision tree-based machine learning. Is it really learning? And that's kind of debatable. Or is it really just sort of evaluating very quickly all possible game states and choosing the moves that optimize over uh, whatever criterion that, the, the, that you d d uh, set, namely what it means to win tic-tac-toe? Right? And as we're going we're to see, and this is maybe kind of the deep question is, and we'll have to answer this, what does it mean to learn, right? And much less, what does it therefore mean to get a machine to learn? That's actually probably the central question of this entire class, is what does that mean to learn? Okay, so decision tree stuff is exactly this. Now, with tic-tac-toe, is this feasible to do on a machine? I mean, yeah, we'll have to go through and program it and write it in Python and maybe have some sort of graphics or a way to select where the moves are going. And yeah, there's some details, right? But in terms of recursing through this entire decision tree, is this feasible? Well, it's more than that because spaces could be empty too. Well, okay, but... Not all of those spaces are valid, or not all of those configurations are valid. Okay. Yeah, three to the power of nine would be the literal maximum number of board positions, right? Now, that's the number of board positions, though, but um, in terms of the... You could, okay? But for the, for the moment, let's not try and fancy program, fancy pants anything, okay? The other thing would be uh, what was it that we realized about, uh, for example, the bear moving at the top left versus the top right? They're really kind of the same, right? Because one of them is just a rotated version of the other. And so we don't need to recompute everything twice. Um, maybe, right? But we'd have to think through, like, how much could we reduce the problem? But even, let's just assume that we are the biggest idiots on the planet and we don't realize any of those potential symmetries or other savings that we could make and we just program it blindly. Three to the power of nine is what? To punch it into Mathematica real quick. It's big, but it's not that big. Huh? Okay, 19,000 potential board positions exist, right? So if we were to go down all the way through the tree, right, at the, there are, well, okay, it's not exactly that many things at the very bottom of the tree, that many leaves, right? But if there's only 19,000 different potential board configurations, uh, it is extremely reasonable that we could get a computer to, to go through all of it, right? Now, something like Go, where the number of board positions theoretically would be like upper bounded by 3 to the 19 squared, right, or 3 to the 19 times 19, which is that number, which is more than the number of subatomic particles in the observable universe, right? So for a very simple game like uh, tic-tac-toe, complete enumeration of the decision tree is totally feasible, okay? Now, what other games could we apply this kind of logic to? Okay, checkers, chess, uh, chess is starting to get kind of big. Yeah, 
So, like, the idea of decision trees, we could apply to any game. It's complete enumeration of the decision tree that's not feasible with some games, right? So, for example, if we can do this for three by three tic tac toe, could we imagine a so like a four by four version or something? Okay, yeah, certainly, right? But what other games are maybe on the order of tic tac toe complexity? Maybe a little bit spicier, but not quite as spicy as say chess. Connect four would be a good one. Right? Now, that's slightly different rules because not all positions are, you can't, like, when you make a move, there are only so many places you can move because of the gravity aspect of it. So, connect four. Um, actually, an interesting uh, puzzle that I had to solve just the other night um, is called Lights Out. And it's, uh, so there was a three by three grid of torches. And the initial configuration was, I think, like that, where the red one was a lit torch and the black ones were unlit torches. And what you could do is you could select a torch. So, for example, let's suppose that I selected the bottom middle torch. Then it would light that torch. And then the two adjacent torches, the middle and the bottom left, would light but this lit torch that was adjacent to what I lit would, would unlight, okay? And so what you had to do was figure out the sequence of torches to light or unlight uh, in order to get all of the torches lit or equivalently all of them unlit. Okay, now, wh where did I encounter this puzzle, perhaps, you might ask? Huh? Yeah, where did I encounter this puzzle? I was playing Diablo 4. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it was a puzzle in a cellar in Diablo 4. Uh, okay. Excellent. I, I'm really a fan. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, it was a stupid puzzle in Diablo 4, right? But that's interesting, right, to enumerate it or to think it through. Um, tic-tac-toe would be a good one. Um, uh, here, another interesting one, this is maybe on the order of chess in terms of complexity. So it didn't dawn on me in this, this game until uh, maybe it was a week and a half ago. So my parents were up here visiting. We, wanted to, we didn't feel like cooking. We wanted to go out to dinner and I'm like listing the different restaurants in town. And my dad's like, you know what? Cracker Barrel sounds great. Okay. So we went to Cracker Barrel. Okay, and what's fun about going to Cracker Barrel when you're a kid? The little peg game, right? So the peg game at Cracker Barrel you, uh, is a triangle, and there's one peg missing, and you have to hop over the pegs kind of like in checkers. And if you hop over a peg, you get to remove the one that gets hopped over, and the goal is to, re to, to end up with only one peg remaining, right? Um, so I've been buying over the summer lots of these little board game type things just basically for this class. Uh, including Connect Four and you know that sort of stuff, right? So chess, could we enumerate every potential chess game? No. Could we enumerate part way down the decision tree? Yeah. Okay. And the how far we can't go the entire way ever, right? But we might be able to go far enough, or if we're really clever maybe we could start to recognize or save some previous or famous games, right? Does anybody play chess, like, seriously? Yeah, so when you're studying chess, what do you do? Yeah, you learn certain opening patterns, you learn certain in-game patterns, you do some of those puzzles where there's a chessboard is in some configuration and it says, like, two moves to mate, and you, you learn some of these puzzles. So you're not completely enumerating the decision tree, but you're getting little snapshots of it. And believe it or not, that's one of the things that Samuel was doing in his checkers paper, is trying to record sort of common scenarios or common game states um, so that you don't have to enumerate the entire decision tree. You can just know in this configuration, the best move is blah. Yeah. 
I think Stockfish is, okay, so Stockfish, by the way, is a, a chess uh, engine. Uh, yeah, I think Stockfish is at least to some extent decision tree based. I do not believe it's any, that it has any neural network capabilities. Yeah. Right. Right, and so it's going to beat you because, you know, the odds are most people are not playing at the level of Stockfish, right? So, um, yeah, so chess engines, and chess engines, I mean, you can program these things. Um, I mean, heck, even like in the 80s, there were chess programs you could buy that were, you know, for your home average kind of enthusiast, probably okay. Are they going to be, you know, grandmaster level champions? No, of course not, but... They weren't designed for that. Yeah, there. I don't know. It depends on how the program is programmed. I just don't know, right? Um, yeah, and it's a fair question, right? How do these chess engines uh, or chess games have the ability to have multiple difficulty settings um, I don't know. That's possible also, is that they program in, okay, yeah, the decision tree may need to do X, but maybe we'll add in some random thing where uh, it doesn't always do exactly the optimal move to, you know, make it more fun so that you're, you're not just getting decimated by a machine. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a fair question, right? So, all right. Anyway, so we'll kick this off um, with some tic-tac-toe stuff, um, which in particular means that we need to start a, well, let's start writing some code and um, sort of figure out how to implement this decision tree and then some of the mathematical particulars in terms of like, well, how are we going to encode the goodness or badness of any given board state uh, or winning versus losing so that we know like, not only can we enumerate the whole decision tree, but how do we make the decisions along the way as to which path to follow? Um, so, anyway, so that's where we'll, we'll get to and start on Tuesday. Okay? Just one, yep, just one question. Just a little bit of thinking. So, all right. So, yeah, there's a, a small little assignment on Canvas. Um, which is to start thinking kind of about just tic-tic-toe. How many states are there? How could you maybe start to reduce it a little bit? Um, a PDF, yeah, just like handwritten, scanned, typed, whatever. No code, just thinking. No. Use the campus copiers because those, yeah. Okay. Yeah, LaTeX is great. Yeah. All right, see you guys later.